Why is this not going away? Hopefully, you're all here for the program we're getting set up for. That's not a question. Okay, that's ready to go when you are. It's recording. Go ahead. Okay, but test from the front of the room. Yeah. <laughs> that's long distance. That's why I got the extra long HDMI, so I can bring it closer. Yay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go back to the Never before we get into the I just want to do something. So, my name is Ben Waterwood, and I'm from the North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort. This lecture today is part of our Maritime Heritage Series. We cover all kinds of topics uh, related to North Carolina's maritime history, culture, and environment. We are holding our lectures here at Fort Wayne because we are about to undergo a renovation project at the museum. So we are unable to use our auditorium. Staff at Fort Macon were very gracious to uh, host us in this lecture series we do, um, and we'll be running them here at least through probably June or July uh, before we can get back into the Maritime Museum building on Trump Street, just across the way in Boca. So our, um, this lecture today is about a particular shipwreck. That was a schooner leaving this case, uh, but we want to put a plug in for our next lecture, which I'll have to get Christine to help me with. But it oh. might be it's the history of Santa. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's a great presentation uh, about you know, Santa being the patron saint of sailors. Uh, it talks about uh, the stories about uh, them throughout the world, actually, um, tied in some of the history and origins of it. The stories. So let's go get ahead and get started. Uh, this will be pretty informal. Uh, I will let you know that we are live streaming this presentation uh, to audiences that can watch over the internet. They cannot see any of us. 
Um, they can only hear me because I have a microphone on, but they can see the slide. If you have a question during the presentation, I'd be, I'd be glad to answer it. Um, but what I'll do is I'll you know, try and repeat it so that the folks that are watching and listening online can hear what your question is. That being said as well, it's being recorded, and then the recording will be posted on the museum's website yeah. in about two weeks. So if you see, if you want to review it again. I briefly mentioned that this presentation is being recorded, and it will eventually get posted to the website and the museum's YouTube page. Uh, where you can watch the same exact slideshow and you'll listen to me narrating it, or you can just mute your video and just watch the stuff. That depends on how much you like. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. I've got a series of slides um, that will talk about this particular schooner. I don't have any pictures of the vessel that, that's covered in the story. Um, this was an older boat, uh, and not, not you know, a lot of a lot of people had boats. A lot more people had boats back then, uh, but they didn't have as many cameras. Uh, they definitely didn't carry the, their cell phones with them and took snapshots of their own of the boats that they were sailing about. Uh, but I have some some maps and some images to kind of help tell this story. Uh, and I can, Kind of helped me along here. Um, I will say that you know, why did I pick this particular vessel? You know, North Carolina's coast has the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic. There will be thousands or more, likely more, shipwrecks that have occurred along the Outer Banks of North Carolina, from Cape Hatteras to nearby you know, Lookout, and even down to Cape Fear. Um, in the New Hanover and Brunswick County area. So how did I pick this particular one? Well, it was a pretty harrowing incident, especially for those that were on the ship, in effect. Uh, but I also found, as I dug into the more, it was an interesting life to the boat itself before it met its demise off the North Carolina's coast. And then even the captain, I thought he was a pretty interesting fellow. Um, so all of that combined together really was what spurred me on. So it's an example of a shipwreck that happened off our coast. Um, it's an example of a, a, a rescue of these people, um, but it's a little more than that too. So I'm going to try and do my best to tell you this story. Okay, we're going to move. Right, we ready to move them in here. All right. So this slide looks pretty boring uh, at first, but what it is, uh, I'm trying to tell you about the school. Uh, this is the American Foreign Shipping, American Voice Register. Uh, so this was where they could compile uh, information about all the boats that are out there. We know in the early years before we were even a country that a lot of things were moving by water. So that's why I said a lot of people had boats. The inland travel routes weren't really what they are today. Um, so it's easier to move things along the coast to go into the bays, the sounds, and into the rivers, up the river some, and to deliver merchandise, to transport people, uh, whatever you needed to do. So when we look down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see, but I, I found in the register was, <clears throat> there's our boat, the lead breeze, Got some specifics about each of these vessels. We have how many, how many feet of the draft, we have the punnage, um, type of uh, passing we were using, uh, when it was built. The Berlin Bridge was built in 1854, before the Civil War. So that was, that was, that was a pretty long time ago. Where was it built? Uh, in Essex, Massachusetts. And it belonged. Uh, it's own port was in Protestantown. Um, there was the owner who said S. Cook. We didn't have complete information, but it was just something to kind of paint the picture of the leading breeds. Uh, here was another one. This was uh, American and foreign shipping, the American Bureau of Shipping Records. Uh, that they printed here in, it's in 1900. So 
neighborhood, Native Greens, Studer, American, Bobstown, the Hale and Fort, and the year 1854, St. Connor, where, where it was built. In the details. So these letters and numbers will be a follow code system in the registry and can tell you those will tell you specific things about that ship. So this is a depiction of a two master school. So put some of those basics that I found in those registries up here on this slide. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the events during the life of this schooner, the leading breeze. I may read these off of this paper. You guys might be able to read right along there. There was an article at the top in 1861, uh, January 15, 1861, Virginia Inspection Law. The schooner leading breeze of the province town has been seized in Hampton Roads by the inspector for four violations of the inspection law of Virginia. The next article down, 1889, Captain Pinkham of Harrington has purchased the schooner leading breeze 69 times for parties in Provincetown, Massachusetts. She will be used in general trading business. So these are just little newspaper clippings that I found about our ship. Um, probably interesting to kind of share with you um, some of the events that, that occurred during the life of this vessel. The, the bottom on the left was from the Portland Daily Press out of Maine, January 1890. The schooner leading breeze from Boston to Bath was caught off the Cape yesterday in a heavy gale. That's Cape Cod. The mainsail was badly split. These boats were used and abused, and the weather took their toll on them. Now, the larger article I have here on the right was from 1896. The schooner leading breeze, Captain Robbins, left Harrington about 14 days ago and also got caught in the ice of the Deer Isle thoroughfare and had to work hard to get out. Captain Robbins was forced to anchor under Squirrel Island, where the water was from four to 20 fathoms. The schooner was light. And as she rolled the pitch fearfully, it seemed that the chains must part, in which case they would have been forced out to sea. It was an anxious night for all on board, but the twins go, the storm went down, and she made Portland all right yesterday. Working on the water and traveling about in these sailing ships was risky business. You know, ocean can get angry sometimes, and in that case, she got really cold. And about froze everything. Um, but this was a good one here. And this is a little bit later in the life of the ship. This is 1900, our favorite 1900. Uh, Lady Breeze almost six off of Maine. Uh, in the article there, uh, from the Sun out of New York, uh, through the Lady Breeze safe, taken off the sinking scooter and carried to Queenstown by the Commonwealth. Special cable dispatch to the sun. Kingstown, October 24th. The steamer Commonwealth, which arrived here today, had on board Captain Gore and the crew of the American schooner Leading Breeze, who were taken off their vessel a few miles from Boston. The Leading Breeze, uh, when she was abandoned, was in the sinking condition. She was sprung a leak during a game. The crew proceeded to Liverpool. Unimportant, the Leading Breeze is the highest name. So the boat was sinking, they needed to get off. Otherwise, they were going to be in a pretty difficult situation. Um, luckily, the steam, steam, steamer comes by the Commonwealth and picks them up. And they say, Don't worry about the boat. Uh, you might sink, and you don't want to be on it when that happens. So, who knows? Um, so, here are some particular details on that incident. Talks about the captain. Uh, they left Boston for Eastport, Maine, and had a cargo of salt and then kerosene on the vessel. Uh, the 16th is when they were caught in the Northwest Gale, which were actually the remnants of a tropical storm, the 61 that season. This was well before the main storms. Uh, the vessel began to take on water and sink rapidly. All four on board abandoned ship and were picked up by 
the scheme of the problem. The damage and sinking streamers drifted past Cape Cod to the destination about 75 miles east by south and across the water. October 17th, the pilot boat from America, under Captain James Reed, salvaged the schooner and towed it to Nantastic Roads past Walter Lane. There's, he comes across the uh, Captain Reed of uh, the pilot boat from America, comes across this sinking schooner and is able to salvage it and tow it back. So that someone can claim it. Uh, the article is out of the Evening Times of Washington, D.C. And it says the abandoned two masted scooter with 80 degrees of Harrington Lane was picked up Wednesday, 75 miles east of Boston, like by the pilot of America, which placed the crew aboard the working vessel in the Manitaskin Road last night. When the men from the pilot boat aboard the craft, she was drifting aimlessly about with water up to her cabin doors. The prize crew clerked up the meat in the hall, pumped her out, and made sail for Boston. Apparently, the crew of the schooner had left in great haste as everything was found aboard, including nautical instruments and clothing. The boat was wrong, and it was supposed to prove well to um, some other vessel. Ten barrels of kerosene oil constituted part of the cargo, but the barrels had been more than the contents were missing. It was supposed the crew allowed the oil to walk over the side in order to calm the waves while they made their escape. I think they probably, I don't know if that's worked or not. That's the environmental concern, maybe. But that was the least of their worries when their lives were at stake. The Leland Greens carried the captain and three men and left here on October 10th for Eastport with a thousand sacks of salt. And the kerosene. So the honor of the boat got pretty lucky that someone found it and drifting 75 miles uh, away off there and they were able to bring it back. Uh, this kept my go in the middle of here we go. This is the this kind of show you the incident on a map. And this is a period map from 1898 in Boston down here. That's where they were supposed to go. Um, this is where they found it here, and it divided the land literally. So the Commonwealth, most of them, probably leaving Boston, maybe headed out across the land, but I don't know what does. Um, so they, they were picked up and brought to Liverpool with many ways to start to drift them off on the gun. They would have to act the picture of you know, the scene of the state. This was an advertisement talking about the million miles of oil mail steamers. So they were regularly between Liverpool, Quebec, Montreal, Liverpool, Halifax, Portland, Liverpool, Boston. About that time, you were those advertisements in that time period. So that's about where the human was found by the pilot. Yeah. This, these articles go into more detail about some, some of the uh, experiences of the leading ways. Uh, these are all in the 1900s, uh, December 1900, uh, this top one from November. Captain Alpheus and Robert Bowen Addison, who was doing a loose scale and named the vessel, Stream of Leading Breeze, was taken by a passing steamer to Liverpool, returned to the Atlantic. They report that it was a timely fuel during the passage, also by American consul at that port, and they, they were joyfully received by the family and friends. We are meant to basically they were drowned for their own time. This was kind of a, this was a big deal for them. Presented by the president, London, December 30th, the Board of Trade had received through the Foreign Office the gold watch and chain in a binocular awarded respectively to the master and second officer of the steamer Commonwealth by President McKinley in recognition of the saving of the crew of the American steamer leading breeze who were taken off their vessel on October 17th, two miles from Boston, uh, in the steamer was sinking condition. Folks on the Commonwealth received a special award. Uh, America rewards five 
Recognized the heroism of British sailors who rescued the Yankee crew. Oh, maybe the British sailor they refer to as hard. The United States government, the Liverpool consulate, has substantially rewarded five seamen for the Dominion liner Topwell for the gallant services in rescuing the crew of the American student reading groups that were wrecked in a hurricane off Portland, Maine, October 16th. The leading breeze was bound from Boston to the Colorado of Salt for Eastport, Maine, and the water law and civil tradition. The rescue was effected with great difficulty in a heavy sea. The steering crew was thoroughly exhausted and the men lost everything they possessed. When they landed at Liverpool, they were supplied with all they needed at the American consulate. Captain McCauley, who skillfully handled the Commonwealth while the rescue was being attempted, and the second officer, Matthias. Who was in command of both crew and also be rewarded. There were a lot of incidents like this that happened at sea during those time periods where you know, there were pretty big events, pretty difficult situations, and awards were given. But here is our captain, the captain of the leading breeze when it wrecks off in North Carolina. Crash. W. Johnson. He was born in 1846. So he was a little bit older than Buck itself, uh, Suffolk County, New York. And he had an interesting life. He came to the Naval Academy in 1863. He resigned from the Navy in 1866 to pursue a less disciplined life. <laughs> you know what that means. He hunted seals and otters on the Pacific coast. He carried arms to the Mexican dictator. Porfirio Diaz. He was nearly killed by firing squad during his first salvage operation of a vessel of Golden Gate, which held $5 million in gold. And that was out on the Pacific coast. He was hired to build a pier for a lighthouse in Key West in 1882. His tenacity and that for getting to wrecks first, he was what we would call a wreck. Uh, if there was a shipwreck somewhere nearby, folks would sail out get to it as quick as they could so they could be the one to conduct the salvage operation potentially make some money. If anything, at least find some cool stuff. But his tenacity and act of getting to the wrecks first and that he was into everything as far as work goes earned him the nickname Paul. So he referred to him as Paul Johnson. I guess Paul's trying to use him now, trying to get into everything. He built schooners and one of them he named for his wife, Alvinia. Uh, he formed the Key West Wrecking Company, which was a salvage company there in the Florida Keys. He carried arms to vessels heading for Cuba before and during the Spanish War. He ran a sawmill in Jacksonville, Florida, that supplied lumber for the building boom in Miami. And he sailed freight to New York and Maine and also took cattle to Cuba. So on the sailing uh, freight from uh, not only New York to Maine, but he was also running stuff from Florida to New York. Um, he always tried to get the fastest time. And that was something that he always strived for. So he wanted to get the fastest record. And he, and he was one of the fastest. Um, he also carried uh, pineapples and fruit and such from Florida to New York. He said he could do it. He said he could get it there before it got it. Uh, he proved that he could do that. Uh, making the trip quickly. We will talk more a little more about it with us. Here, here are the two houses that he owned in the Keys. This is in Key West. The house on the right was where him and his wife and family were. But he collected so much junk and so much stuff over the years of salvaging that his wife told him, you need somewhere to store this if you're not going to in our boat house where we were. So he built this house just for the purpose of keeping his junk. Um, and it was right beside the main house. 303 Whitehead Street, 305 Whitehead Street. Yeah. And this was the plaque that was on that um, house on the right. It said, King of the Records, Brash W. Johnson, whose outstanding success earned him the nickname of Paul Johnson. He built this house with 
longer and sounder correct on the roof. Seems to me like a pretty interesting character. I can't imagine reading him, hearing all these stories that he had, uh, and to be in front of the firing squad, uh, to, to be running uh, weapons for his you know, Spanish war and dictators in Mexico. All right, let's go to the location. Where did this spec happen? Where did the human dreams come ashore in North Carolina? The North Carolina was a difficult coast to travel by to begin with. You can see Cape Hatteras, Cape Lookout, the Cape Fear all projecting out into the ocean. So anybody that was sailing north to south, whether from Baltimore to Charleston, from, from Savannah to Philadelphia, you had to go around North Carolina in these sandbars and shoals that projected off of these points. Sometimes up to 15 miles or more. And those same bars can be pretty shallow. So that's a good reason why we were thinking that was a graveyard at home. It was difficult to navigate past coast. We had lighthouses to, to warn people okay, this is a dangerous spot. And you get here and here and here. And, and even this stretch here, then you're headed south. With the ships that wrecked along this part of the coast. And the bodies that washed ashore is supposed to story of how body out of God's name. And so many victims, shipwreck victims, came washing up on the beach here. So there's also strong currents that meet and glide off of Cape Hatteras, the Gulf Stream, the Labrador Current, those could play with it, and not to mention the weather. Uh, the weather seems to always be a little bit more soft in our coast than anywhere else. Maybe it's because of those curves. This is where the wreck happened. I know it's hard to see. I'm going to be zooming in to this location. Uh, but that is Overcoat in right here. Uh, here we are in the part of the county. This one is the Kerry. The lighthouses that were present to warn mariners about the treacherous shoals. Uh, but the federal government also realized that we need people there to help in case something happens. If you're a lighthouse keeper, your main objective is to keep the light on, kind of like Motel 6, you know, always keep the light on, right? Um, well, the lighthouse keepers did not run out and save shipwreck victims. It was usually the lighthouse keeper and an assistant lighthouse keeper, and then the fans who didn't have the means to go save people. But the life saving service was created so that someone would be there to help those people during the shipwreck. Um, they'd row the lifeboat out, or surf boat is what they called it. Eventually, they had motor power boats. Sometimes the wreck was close enough to the shore that swim out to you and bring it back to the beach. Uh, these were all those stations. Uh, at the time in, in North Carolina, anyway, and some of them on the Virginia, but we can see uh, all the stations here in North Carolina starting in Wash Woods, all the way down to Oak Island. A wreck happened at Overcoat Inn. So, where are the stations that we're going to look at? Zoom in on it. Okay, Overcoat. Well, that's pretty close to the end of it. But this one at the time, the Overcoat station was on the other end of Overcoat, the Hatteras Inlet. So our leading breeze was actually even easier to respond to by the crew from the Portsmouth station. And that is in Carter County, that's on Portsmouth Island, on the south side of Overcoat Inlet, so northeast end of Portsmouth Island. So that's who we're going to ride on to save our ship record. But mark where some of those stations are on this chart from 1885. In blue, those are the life saving service stations. Now they they would eventually become the US Coast Guard. That wasn't until 1915. You know, we have one of those stations right beside us today, US Coast Guard Station Fort Mason. Didn't put it on this map, but it's located right there. Um, it, it was built. After this incident happened, 
and to the port. So there's where station Overcook was in the mansion right by Hatter Assembly. But our wreck happened here, way down the other end of the Overcook Island. So there's station Portsmouth is located right here. Some people refer to this as Portsmouth Island, some people call it Four Banks, more Four Banks. There's another station here in Carter County. And then there was one here at the lookout to mention Fort Macon. And we even had one, the other end of Third Banks station right here. So we'll zoom in a little bit more even. You can start to see this is a, a nautical chart. Um, there's the Portsmouth Station. Um, this is Overcoat Island. And when you look at all these numbers in the shaded areas, those are in feet. In the non-shaded area, those numbers are in fathoms. I think seven or so feet is a fathom. Uh, but when you hard to see on, on, on this, but we're going to zoom in some more. There's our station in Portsmouth. These, these guys are posing for the picture this day. Um, the building still exists. Uh, it's obviously now part of the Cape Lookout National Seashore. Uh, it is registered as a historic building. They were not right on the beach like a lot of those stations were. So they couldn't see, they could see the ocean too well. They could see the inlet pretty good. Um, this lookout tower up here. Uh, and it was a much larger station than some of the other more modest you know, buildings that were really just glorified boathouses. Uh, and they had some sleeping quarters, a kitchen area, storage room. So this one was actually pretty substantial. Uh, you can see their surf boat right here that they keep it in the building and they launch it out into this little creek that they then connect to uh, Portsmouth uh, in Urban Coast Inn. So that's the head keeper and the crew posing for the picture. I don't, this picture, I'm not sure what the date was, but taken for this one, but this might not be the exact clue or responded to the leader. Here's an aerial shot of the station right here. You see this little creek connected to out here to the inlet. This is Portsmouth Village. So they were some of the they were some of the fortunate life-saving members that they got to be right by the village. Uh, maybe their family members lived here, so they got to make friends. There was a church. There were actually several churches in Portsmouth at that time. The schoolhouse. Uh, post office and general store. Some of the stations along the outer banks were pretty remote um, and you had to walk go miles for a sale just to go see some other people and go spend time with the family. Pretty the station Portsmouth was pretty fortunate. This is a much later photograph. So you can see the A lot of these buildings still exist. The park service is Fixing them up or has fixed them up and maintained them as a historic village to go visit. The easiest way to get there is go to Overcook <laughs> and then take a small ferry uh, right over here to, to the village. Uh, otherwise, you got that whole drive to get up from uh, Atlantic, take you over on a ferry to Four Banks. And then you got to hope that there's no temporary inlets that are cut through Four Banks because <laughs> sometimes that happens. There might be one right now. Uh, the change with the seasons on us, I can't keep track of them. Okay, so there's Station Portsmouth, and, and I just threw this up here to show you that they had six surfmen at the station during the time of the incident. And here's the, the man listed the head keeper, Ferdinand Ferro. Um, and some of these are local names. If you're from the area, some of them may be some of your ancestors. Dennis Mason, Washington Roberts, George Hugo, Andrew Jones, Peter Culture, and Walter Creek. So they were stationed there with the sole responsibility of saving the ship. They would go out and patrol. Obviously, they're posing for a picture here. Why would you do it? rubbing their boat all the time parks. These were two pictures that the Park Service shared with me that I put together. Um, which would otherwise would have been too. Would have been separate here. This was they were taken the same day. Uh, the, that's the head keeper who's usually at the helm. Um, they're really stern and steering for 
and then investing through the amount of their required work trying to get through those breakers to get through that surf to that rescue. This picture was taken in 1901, so these are the fellows here in these photographs that would have gone out the same folks from the leading breeders. Here are some incidents I talked about things related to our schooner. Here are some incidents that these men dealt with during 1901 um, at the Portsmouth station. One time in August, they found a body. Uh, on the other, they threw the body in the head of the proper burial near Rock Island. I don't know where that is, but it's somewhere around the village. Uh, in October, during the middle watch, the station patrol saw a fear. Uh, Dangerous sort of close to the south bank of the river that they went. They fired a warning signal and said, Hey, look out, you're going to be cold. So sometimes things are non eventful, but it could have become something that was bad if you got seen as you get into the shallow water. Uh, here was November 11th. The American schooner J. L. Moffitt, while working through the cut from Wallace Channel to the Pamela Sound, the vessel stranded. One and a half miles northwest by one and a half north from the station. The surfman at the Portsmouth station boarded the vessel with 11 anchors. And on the 12th, they got the steam in Florida for the master's request to keep the supply of the vessel with fresh water since these, the folks on the steam had run out. So sometimes it was just helping ships get on the ground. And that's a good situation in the day. We flood the vessel, it could be on the Atlantic, nothing was damaged, no one was hurt, no life. <laughs> now, why did our scooter wreck? Well, same reason why most of them do in the bridge are in the Atlantic, is usually because of a storm. November 1901, a strong storm passed along the coast. Um, gale force winds over 50 miles an hour from the southeast that kicked up the seas and the surf. And uh, Virginia, all the way to Cape Fear, heavy rain and fall of poor visibility. And the storm eventually made its way up to New Orleans. Now, some newspaper clippings had a uh, Wilmington Messenger from November 29th, 1901. Uh, talks about the violent storm dipping in property of New York and New Jersey, the coast turned, the ship stranded, helped down with the pieces, 24 men rescued by light saving crews. And that, that didn't even really mention how you know how it was on the North Carolina beaches. There's a movement on here. The intended route to the leading leads. Captain Bradish was going to take it from New York all the way to the Keys where he lived. This is a report of the incident from the US Life Saving Service annual report. You can see November 23rd. Two and a half miles east southeast of the station, the name of the station is Portsmouth. Schooner Lee Breeze, having a pilot's name, Master Paul Johnson. Where from and where down, New York City and the US, cargo, cinders, and wrecking material. I'm guessing maybe the wrecking material was things that were used to salvage a bunch of shipwreck cinders. Anyone want to help me out there? I thought maybe cinder blocks. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I bet it needs something. And then we've got way over here in this column that we reported. Person on board four, person saved four, persons secured at station four. In one of the days they hung out at station Portsmouth after they were saved, 31. <laughs> it's been a whole month at station Portsmouth. I can't imagine. The life saving crew sitting around the wood stove, all the crew from the leading breeze and our character, Paul Johnson, <laughs> telling all kinds of stories every night for a month <laughs> before they finally found their way, their passage back home to Florida. Uh, you know, these guys probably formed a pretty, pretty quick bond. They saved their lives. Um, they sure we were going to die. Uh, and so, what not better way to spend the time than? Getting to know each other and telling stories, probably playing music, and even making friends in the village of Portsmouth. Who knows? Okay, so I mentioned about the numbers on this chart. So these ones are in fathoms, these ones are in feet. 
see like a seven, seven foot there, two feet, five feet. So this was a pretty shallow bar up here. Here's the main channel. I think that's Wallace Channel that we referred to earlier to get into Oka Coke and came into Sand. There's Oka Coke. Here's Portsmouth Island. There's the life saving station right there. So if they saw something happen, they could go around in their small surf boat to go out and try to help you. So mark the station. That's where the main breeze actually went, way out here. Um, yeah, they said it was foggy, raining. The, the, the lifesavers had to walk the beach um, in bad weather and at nighttime. That was part of their job to look for shipwrecks. So it could have been that, that they spotted the Lady Breeze and said, Uh oh, we got a ship on the bar. I better run back and get to the station and summon the rest of my crew and tell the head keeper so that we can get jump into action and see what's going on and save some people. So remember, it's a southeast wind coming from this direction. So it could have pushed the boat. Maybe the vessel became disabled. Maybe the sails were torn. Maybe the rudder broke. I don't know. They probably got pushed up from the swells and the wind uh, that were headed in this direction. Okay, this is from that official life saving service report. Um, it talks about some of the details. November 23rd, the schooner leading breeze and the station responded to Portsmouth. Strand, uh, stranded during the southern gale on Dry Shoal Point, two and a half miles east southeast from the station. Station crew promptly manned the surf boat and started for the scene of disaster. Meantime, the schooner had broken up, so the leading breeze is just getting torn to pieces by those south swells and southeast swells getting by the storm. The boat was built in 1854. Maybe it was leaking, that's why they were running to the shore. You know, so they can increase their chances of surviving instead of sinking out farther off the beach, getting close, and maybe they can at least swim in or take a life wave. The lifesavers found the crew of four men adrift on the vessel's cabin. Boat broken apart, the cabin is torn away from the ship. Captain Johnson and his crew members are hanging on to the cabin for dear life as they go for a wild ride during this storm. So they had, so the lifesavers found the crew ripped on a cabin to which they had lashed themselves. So they tied themselves to the cabin at this point. They said, well, I hope I don't fall off in the water. At least this part is floating and I might survive. The shipwrecked men were taken to the station in the surf boat and were given food and shelter, also dry clothing from the stores for the Women's National Relief Association. Later, the keeper provided them with transportation to their homes. The vessel was a total loss. So these reports were kind of, you know, this is what happened, this is what we did. It's, it's part of the story, but sometimes it's not that exciting. That was their job. They had to go do it. They did that stuff quite often. There they are. Um, this is the 1909. Some of the names still might have been the same. Uh, they were still stationed there, but that's the surf boat they used that they rode out through the main breeze. <laughs> There's our shipwreck site. That's the wind and swell direction. I mentioned that's where they had to go to get them. They found them somewhere at some point because it went on the cabin roof, roof and they're just drifting probably in the same direction, I assume, especially if the tide's going in. They've been pushed in over the shoals. Through the breakers and waves into the end, and eventually we're going into Pamlico Sound, and who knows where. Um, there was a hurricane in the early 2000s, Hurricane Irene, and it broke the Diamond Shoals buoy offshore from its anchor, and the buoy drifted across the banks, and ended up across Pamlico Sound, and on the mainland, I think, in a swan quarter or the Pike County somewhere. So, when there's that much water and there's that bad of a storm going on, that can happen. Now, this is the thank you letter from, from our friend uh, Paul Johnson. He writes a thank you letter to the Honorable Sumner Kimball, the General Superintendent of the Life Saving Service, 
based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Fortson, North Carolina, November 25th, 1901. Dear sir, I desire to call to your notice the great service that the keeper and crew of the light setting station of this place rendered myself and crew by taking us off the deck of the schooner leading breeze the stranded off Ogrecook Inlet on the afternoon of November 23rd and immediately broke up. Caught in a heavy southeast gale with sails split, we were unable to weather the breakers and were driven ashore by the wind and sea at a place where the surf was the heaviest. Our boats were soon stowed in by the big seas that boarded us. That's what he's referring to the life. With tremendous seas breaking over her, our schooner soon commenced to break up. And the thick fog hanging over us made it impossible for us to see the land or to see the way through the surf. We lashed ourselves to the cabin top and drifted clear of the wreck as she went to pieces. The breakers washing us shoreward with only what we stood in. We had small prospect of reaching land and were abandoning, abandoning all hope when, just before dark, we sighted the lifesavers in their surf boat, making their way out through the shoals and breakers, winding through narrow channels and heavy surf, and with difficulty avoiding the floating wreckage which was drifting in their way and adding more danger to the difficult task of taking us off. Despite all obstacles, their object was successfully accomplished just as it was growing dark. And we were speedily landed and at once taken to the station where we were furnished with dry clothing every one pretended to made to feel that we were among friends whose attentions were heartfelt and sincere we wish to thank you as the head of this the service which saved our lives and placed the, us under so great an obligation yours truly radish w johnson master american student leading breeze charles w in front Mate Olaf Vasmer Seaman and T.S. Trumbull Seaman. So those four men would have easily died if it wasn't for the life saving service. They did the job and they did it well and they saved them. That was the actual thank you letter that Captain Johnson wrote. Uh, this, I'm going to read this article. I know it seems pretty long, but this is out of the Newburn Weekly Journal. November 29th, 1901. I might even have trouble reading it because it's a print. Uh, this is a theory newspaper, so you can count my guess. And it might be easier for me to read about the reader. I don't know. <laughs> Rescue that's some brave lifesavers. Rescue of the crew of four men at Portsmouth. Neck of the student reading in Portsmouth, North Carolina, November 23rd. Uh, I read your paper occasionally, though not a subscriber, and thinking you might want a little news from the coast, I sent you the following. The 23rd instant was quite a wild day of the, on the coast here. The wind blew a gale from south southeast with a heavy rain and fog. At 2.43 p.m. during a whiff in the fog and rain, the lookout at the Portsmouth, North Carolina Lifesaving Station sighted a vessel of ground on the bar at the Inlet. It reported to Captain Terrell, who at once gave orders to man the lifeboat, which was quickly done by the grilling crew in the blue boat and white hats, were soon speeding on the way to the Rugby, fell six able bodies, far heels, and as much paper as the boat could bear in the gale. So they could throw up a little sail on some of these surfboards. Uh, but I want to mention that he, in there, the person that was writing this says that there happened to be a break in the fog and the rain when the life saving crew member was walking the beat. If it wasn't for that little break in the weather, what were the chances of them seeing that there was a scooter grounded on the shoals? All these things that came together to save these. I don't know what we can uh, claim that it was, but it, it worked in their benefit. Uh, night was close upon them, and they had to encounter a strong flood uh, with the wind and the driving rain directly against them. But the lifesavers knew that what they did must be done quickly, that the vessel was lying in a very dangerous breaker. And Liable to, to go to pieces at any moment, which she did. By the time the lifeboat was halfway to the wreck, it was then growing dark with blinding rain driven by the gate from their faces 
So they kind of lost all sight of that. The disc did not turn on the late life stages back to seek shelter for themselves from the storm, but inspired with the hope that they might, if possible, ascertain whether there was anyone alive in the wreck, with the chance that someone might have caught a piece of the debris of the wreck and drifted in toward the shore that they might rescue them before it got too dark to find them. And their determination of Captain Taylor, so readily agreed to by his crew, to push on and venture as far out as possible, resulted in saving their lives and the whole crew of four men. It would have been a matter of impossibility for any boat to have reached the wreck of the Union against such a strong wind and high sea, but it so happened. And when the vessel went to pieces, the crew had lashed themselves to the skylight on top of the house, and upon this, they were drifted in toward the shore so the light would keep them just in time. Think that the, the, the light was before the darkness and entirely hidden them from sight and formed the red tide, which would soon have been running out of the sea to take them back into the high breakers and out of the reach of all human help. While we see the hand of providence in this, Yet, had it not been for the timely assistance of Captain Terrell and the willing hands to apply the oars, four men would undoubtedly have found a watery grave before midnight. The guilt of the vessel was the two master schooner leading breeze of Key West, Florida, from New York to Key West, in ballast of 200 tons of concrete, stone, and rock of wrecking gear. Captain B. W. Johnson, the master, was sole owner. All of little loss and no insurance, the crew was taken to the life saving station and well cared for. AJ Simpson, Keeper, Northwest Point, Royal Shoal Light Station, North Carolina. So, who was this AJ Simpson speaking so proudly of a life saving station? He was a keeper of the Northwest Point, Royal Shoal Lighthouse. Here's Forsman, here's Oakland, Midland, and Northwest Point Royal Shell Lighthouse was right up here. This is what it would have looked like. This is not a picture of the Northwest Point Shoal Spoon Pile Lighthouse. This is the Moose River Spoon Pile Lighthouse. A lot of people don't realize that we not only had lighthouses along the banks, the typical light towers made of brick, we actually had lighthouses that actually were houses. And they were on screw pilings and they were out in the middle of the sand. It's Pamlico Sound, Alamal Sound, the Noose River, the Revenant River, um, the mouth, the, the confluence of Tor and Pamlico Sound. Um, so this fellow that wrote that article was the head keeper of the Northwest Point Royal Shoal Lighthouse. There's the flashing out there. There was another screw pile lighthouse here. Um, there was even more around, but so that he was stationed at something like this, where he made sure that the light appeared with on all the time, but he couldn't have helped the shipwreck victims, even though he had a boat that he could lower down with no change on the booty of the markers. Um, but he had heard about it and he respected those, those life saving crew out of Portman. And probably because there were times when the life savers would go help uh, the screw pile lighthouse keeper. They would bring them provisions, they would bring them uh, firewood or coal. Or, Food, even sometimes if they live stuck out there in long periods of storms. So that's who they wrote that article to send me the praise for the life safety. So Captain Bradish Johnson and his crew were housed at Station Portsmouth for 31 days before they reached their home in Florida. Here's a different view of Portsmouth Village. Uh, that church is still there, all these structures are still there. If you want to go visit, I would uh, advise you to go in January or February. Otherwise, the mosquitoes and the biting flies will carry you off. <laughs> and no one will ever see you again. <laughs> so, Bradish Johnson died 1914 in the U.S. And he died while he was um, following out a schooner in the Florida Keys. Um, he was barely able to never remember the lake and never crashed in the lake. So he died with the word of wish with his boots on and in the sea he left. He was salvaging the ship back. But he did not die at Okapokina. 
That was all I have prepared for you on the story. I hope that you enjoyed the presentation. I'll be glad to take some questions if you have any. Otherwise, um, thank you for coming to the lecture. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, at Fort Aiken for hosting us uh, throughout this period of construction. As I mentioned, we do have another lecture coming up. Santa Claus. And the one after that will be on the life saving service stations of um, part of that county. That's where uh, that That date, I think, is December 11th. Yeah, I think that's a Wednesday. Yeah, it was going to be a third. We're going to be a third Wednesday. It's the Wednesday. Yeah, you should see it advertised um, either there or just. Thank you all for coming. I have a question back here. Yeah, that seems like a really dangerous job. Does the record how many died were lost of the service? Uh, there, there is. I don't have a number off the top of my head. Um, in North Carolina, I know probably at least a half a million. Yeah, these were skilled men at what they did. Most of the ones that were hired had already spent their life on the water to begin with. They were usually fishermen, um, or they were in, in coastal trade, so they were uh, sending goods back and forth to the mainland. Um, and again, everyone that lived out along the coast got around by boat anyway. So they were familiar with the currents, they were familiar uh, with the inlets, the tides, the sandbars. Um, they, were, they were pretty skilled in what they did. They practiced every week, the life saving crew practiced every week. They got forgotten to repeat the question for the to the Zoomers online, but the question was, it seemed like a pretty difficult job, how many men you may lost in the service. Um, but yeah, it did, it did happen. There was one particular event up off the Curituck County where the surf was so rough, they launched the their surf boat to respond to the wreck and the whole thing flipped over and uh, most of the men drowned in that incident. Um, but otherwise, you'd be surprised that it wasn't as many as you think it would be. They practiced with their surf boats every week. They practiced, you know, to get it going through the breakers. Um, and they even practiced flipping the boat and then riding it uh, as the, the boats uh, kind of evolved into self mailing and self riding vessels. Uh, they practiced with Regent Booby and like the line that they would send out to the shipwreck. They did this and they uh, had to just so they could be. Any other questions? Do you know if there's a inshore lake houses in the land of sound and it's still out there? No. <laughs> the question was are the inshore or the screw pile white houses still present in, in the sound internal waters of Panico Sound? Uh, the only real, the only one original building that still stands. Was moved to the waterfront of Edenton. It was the Roanoke River Screw Pile Lighthouse. Um, when it was surplus, it was purchased in the 50s and it was taken um, <clears throat> near Edenton by a barge and somebody set up the barge down on shore and they filled in dirt around it and it became their summer vacation home and, and then eventually residence. <laughs> Uh, but then that was sold and was purchased by the, the Edenton the Historical Commission, who resurrected it, refurbished it as it was when it was a screw pile lighthouse, moved it to the Edenton waterfront, put it up on screw piles. There is a replica of the earlier Roanoke screw pile lighthouse, but it's just a replica, and it's actually on land in the waterfront of Plymouth, North Carolina. Um, and then others that have been decommissioned. One was moved to Ardanthe and became the schoolhouse, but now it's the community center and it's had additions to it. So you really want to be able to recognize the structure. Um, but that's, yeah, we had, I don't know, the total off the top of my head, North Carolina had at least 15 or more screw pile lighthouses that were operated one time. And the only one, original one left was at Eden. It's a kind of a forgotten part of our maritime history, if you will. We North Carolina was second for number of screw pile lighthouses, only to 
uh, Virginia due to the Chesapeake Bay, a much larger internal body of water in the top of the And there's some original ones still standing there. But those are fascinating to me to think that that's where you live. You spent your time out there. You've got some time off. You can go see your family. There was usually your people and assistant people. And you were there above the water. They, they spent a lot of time fishing. <laughs> and there were times where families would be stuck out there so they could spend the holidays with their, you know, with their, with their husband and children could see their dad. And during the Christmas presents, you were sure you would have a good time. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you guys have a record of like all the sea captains in the ship that are coming in and out of the boat area? Oh, yeah. Do you have that? The question was do we have a record of all the sea captains and ships that come in and out of Bunker? The Maritime Museum does not. There are records of a lot of the sailing vessels, um, but there is there are there's bound to be the, the port records, uh, probably in state archives, but have not done the digging. Our maritime historian David Bennett would probably be able to answer that question better than me. But housed in our collection, I don't think that we have any those records. I can imagine there was a lot of that came in. Yes, sir. Yeah, we can write and tell about the uh, uh life saving service annual report. Yeah, do you have that? Those are mostly been digitized and are online. Uh, so the question was, do we have uh, copies of the annual life saving service reports? Um, most of those have been digitized and online and available to various websites. One of which is the U.S. Life Saving Service Heritage Association. You can actually scroll and pick um, for each year. And they did their reports on fiscal year, July to June. Um, and that's how I find a lot of my information is through these archive reports that are now available, um, at least for some of the specific wreck details and locations. Some of the incidents. That's a good question. I mean, that's that's what makes it fun is I kind of figure out where all this information is and how I'm going to put it all together, kind of just tell this one story. And a lot of work goes into it. Yes, sir. Dan, are you going to continue to try to dig up some more of these facts about these wrecks on the okay. Carolina coast? Are you doing another presentation for it? Yeah, it's kind of like job security because they're assembly. <laughs> <laughs> they can do this for 50 more years, but they're not real. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll see, but it's always it's always fun and exciting, and I enjoy bringing it out to audiences like yourself <laughs> to learn about it and hear these stories. Because this was the real deal. This is what you know. Yeah. It wasn't Hollywood. It wasn't make believe. It wasn't you know, a written you know, novel or something. It's what really happened. Um, people were tough back <laughs> then. People are tough today. It's a different time. Yeah, very Thank you all for the questions. Yeah. Is, is Paul Branch still working in Fort Lake? Well, he has retired. He has passed the torch. He still comes out and volunteers doing tour guide stuff quite often, but he retired back in January of this year. So I'm not going by most of the year without him. He, he wrote some pretty good books about um, the World War II activity on the coast of North Carolina. That's the most recent books. is very, very, very exhaustive on you know, the German submarine U boat activity. He's still in the area. He's still living in the area. Yes, sir. Well, thank you again for coming. I uh, hope you enjoy your visit here at Fort Macon for the afternoon. If you haven't, you can go to the fort and uh, sit in uh, our hall here at the visitor center. Um, thanks again, uh, Paul, and the community for allowing us to be here. Have a good afternoon. <laughs> Is there no <laughs> no, 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 no,